Hi everyone, welcome to Liberty Tactics. It's the 8th of June 2013 and it's about quarter to 11. James and I are here with the one and only that's David the, that's the That's the main camera. <laughs> <laughs> Just letting you know. As a, yeah. I'll talk to them. You talk to them. <laughs> hey everybody out there on the interwebs land. Yep. Right. David, how are you? I'm good, I'm really good. It's warm in here though, isn't it? It is really it's warm. warm. Yeah, but uh, no, I mean, it's uh, amazing what's happened in the last few days because I remember my first Bilderberg location was uh, in uh, Switzerland in 1995 and uh, the great Jim Tucker, um, not many people even heard of the Bilderberg group in those days, never mind thought anything about it. And um, we got this email, uh, those that were actually on, the, on the, 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 the mailing list, and he said, I found out where the Bilderberg group's meeting this year and it was a place called Bergenstock. And, um, was on top of a mountain in, in Switzerland. And the story of my life since, you know, what happened to me in the early 1990s. A few weeks before I got the email, I'd arranged to go and stay with some friends in Switzerland at the same time, two hours away. Mm. So um, I remember I, I drove down the day before the, the meeting started and uh, they were putting up the, you know, temporary fencing and all that stuff. and all the, suits were around with their um, name tags on and all the rest of it. And th th there were three really unbelievably James Bond type flash hotels next to each other. The, the park, uh, the Grand and the Palace. And then I, I went away and I came back on one of the days that it was going on and I couldn't even get on the mountain. Um, the, the, there was a small village at the bottom of the mountain road and then it went out of the village and all up the mountain right up to these hotels some distance away right where you left the village there was a roadblock and there was this um, Swiss policeman in a, in a luminous orange jacket I remember that clearly it was like one of them you know uh, and I said to him um, what's going on I came up here the other day I just want to go to the hotel he said oh top secret top secret I, I said you know he was a nice bloke I said, well, what do you mean top secret? What kind of top secret? What's going on? He said, I don't know. He said, I just know it's top secret. And I thought, yeah, that was just a classic compartmentalization, the way, the way that they keep from people um, what's going on and what they're actually policing. Um, and only a few people actually know what, what, what's, go what's going on, what's happening. So that was 1995. And then you come to 2013. I mean, you know, we've been working to, to pick off and pick off and pick off their secrecy to the point where we can pull it into public awareness. Now, that started to happen in recent uh, years in terms of public awareness of those that were looking for it anyway. But what the great breakthrough here this year is that awareness has broken through into mainstream perception through the mainstream media in Britain, who, who by the sheer... Um, uh, weight of, of evidence and interest have been forced to um, look at it and face the fact that it's happening. And you know, there are still people in the media um, who are saying, oh yeah, but it don't really matter, really, and all that stuff. We said, excuse me, deep breath, look at it again. Here you have all these um, people representing corporations, politics, banks, uh, it, 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 you know, all these uh, military people and, and, and like Petraeus, CIA, former CIA. And they're meeting under one roof across borders, across uh, uh, different countries. Um, and we're not allowed to know what they're discussing. I mean, to say that doesn't matter and it's not really relevant is ludicrous. But what the mainstream media are, are, are now, I'm, you know, I feel from a bit. Because in the next little while, and not too long a while either, this is kind of the start of it. They've got to start facing the fact that they have been reporting the world inaccurately, in an absolutely inverted way, in fact, mm -hmm. often the opposite of what the world's like. Um, and face the fact that they have been misleading people about what's been happening and to what end. And instead of, and at the same time, abusing alternative uh, media and researchers who've been 
telling them how it really is. And they've got to now come to terms with that because the information that um, the world is controlled by a hidden hand and most important on top of that, the fact that the public mind is now opening all over the world is opening to the fact that A, it does look like this is the case. That combination, um, which has been making the mainstream media in terms of interest and, um, and uh, people buying newspapers, etc., which has been eroding their relevance for years, well, that erosion is going to become a landslide, especially the more that we in the alternative media get more and more outlets and opportunities for communication. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm not saying that this weekend the dam's coming down. It's not. But I tell you what, when we look back to this weekend, we will see it as a very significant crack in that dam. Um, and, you know, I've, I've used this analogy before over the years. You know, when a dam is holding back a, a, a vast body of water, it takes a long time for that body of water and the weight and the pressure to start showing cracks in the dam. But from the cracks showing to the dam coming down can be very, very short. And we are now seeing this, this cusp of awareness, which can now start us moving on to the next stage, which is um, going on, although we still have to keep doing this, going on from just removing ignorance of what's happening through information, but start removing the acquiescence of the public to authority. So that, uh, as I say, that the tail's not wagging the dog and it's not wagging the elephant, it's wagging the planet. That's, yeah. that's, that's, the, that's the dynamic of who controls to who is controlled. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, see it, I see a way out of this when I see billions of people being manipulated by a handful. Yeah. You know, I, I, do, I do see a way out of this. <laughs> And, and it's ignorance and acquiescence. Now, the ignorance is starting to, to, to dilute. This is a major, major step on that road this weekend. I mean, if it ended now, we, we, it's been great. Mm. Uh, of course, we, we want to do more in the next couple of days. Um, but that, um, that, that ignorance that keeps people in servitude through not realizing they're in servitude... Mm. Um, that is being eroded. And another thing that's adding to it, it's like a perfect storm is starting to come together here. What's also um, adding to this is now people's daily experience. You know, when, 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 you, when you, you're just about paying the rent or easily paying the rent and, and there's food in the fridge and all that stuff, then it's kind of, oh, no, I don't really want to know. I'm in the, I'm in, I want to talk like the real world, mate. But when the real, real world in starts impacting upon your life, and that's what's happening to vast numbers of people with these austerity programs uh, and so on, then that concentrates the mind. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, in every sense, what has been in the shadows is being drawn out. What's been in the shadows doing the manipulating is being drawn out, and also, What's been in the shadows waiting to pounce, i.e. the banking crash and the uh, austerity programs and all these things that have been planned for so long in the shadows, they've now hit the surface. So now we're bringing the, the, the unseen into the scene on so many levels, and that it, it, it gives us an opportunity now to concentrate minds to the point where we can start to do something about this, which is removing the acquiescence to authority mm -hmm. that allows the few to dictate to the many. Yeah, right. We noticed um, that this year, I mean, never has there been any mention of it on the BBC ever. And this year, they are forced to have it yeah. come to, uh, and come and talk about it, and all the other mainstream papers. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Guardian has done it over the years with Charlie Skelton, but now the mainstream media are having they, they've got no choice because it, it's so big. And the amount of, we've been talking to residents, we've been talking to police. And they're all in the same. They're all in the same mindset. They're all sort of agreeing with us. They understand why people are so 
aggrieved by it all, don't mm. they? That you know, well, even was, the residents, you know. I was shocked because uh, you know, as we, we were driving in on the Wednesday night, the police were very standoffish, um, telling us that we weren't allowed in. We had to stay. We were all huddled together in a very small wedge in between mm. some bushes, and you know, you start getting that aggression built up because you know, mm. especially people that don't like being mm. oppressed and, and and you know, pushed around like that. But then I think as time went on and the police saw that we were all just normal people and we just wanted to know what these guys were doing, all very polite, courteous, they started opening up and realizing, you know, that what they were probably told was going to be coming. You know, they, they were probably all jacked up thinking yeah. that it was, you know, that there was a bunch of people yeah. ready to, you know, and cause the some mayhem. The residents had of no Watford are disgusted because you know why should we be footing the bill for these multi-millionaires when pensioners are having their you know their bus passes taken yeah. taken away and we're covering footing the bill for these millionaires to sit in secret illegally it's mm. it's just unbelievable but this year I think is a monumental year for the exposure of it yeah well, what we have fun enough um, symbolism is very powerful because symbolism gives you an image that tells a massive story. It's like a picture paints a thousand words and all that stuff. And when you look at the setup at the Grove, it is the society that they want globally, and it is the society that we're moving towards so fast. You've got the tiny few, 140 is it, mm -hmm. um, in this flash, um, massively expensive hotel. You then have the people excluded to the periphery, um, kept from the hotel, the elite, in the Hunger Games movie, The Capitol, yeah. um, by this ring of steel, and you have this ring of police keeping the people apart from the elite. And the society they want, and the society we're heading towards so fast, is a tiny, tiny elite of mega rich people living apart from the masses in high tech luxury, just like the capital in the Hunger Games. And then they want not a middle class and working class like staff, they want the few mega rich and they want the rest mega poor in mega poverty. Um, and it, it even took me aback. Um, a few uh, weeks ago, a couple of three weeks ago, when I saw a graph in America of incomes for American people, um, what you would normally have up to this point, and even this was a state of equality, was poor people going up through middle class to rich people, like that. But the reason, I was talking this to, uh, about this to Alex Jones yesterday, the reason they are targeting what they call in America middle class, and, and here too, but ours is quite slightly different version, is because they don't want that. Mm -hmm. They want that. Mm -hmm. And this graph of current American incomes didn't go like that. It went like that from poor through what they call middle class, because of course that's been fantastically in America by um, outsourcing jobs and what have you, and the end of manufacturing industry. And then from here, it soared up. And this uh, bit here was just 1% of the American population. Um, and that will be hierarchical in terms of wealth as well. And that part of the graph was so big they had to put the top next to it because it went off the page. Now, when you look at what I've just described, and I've been describing all these years about what the game is, the tiny, tiny uh, mega rich and the rest mega poverty, uh, you, you, you can see we ain't far off now, especially in places like America. Look at Greece and stuff. Yeah. Um, and this is what the banking crash was about. The banking crash, and many of the people involved in that banking crash, like Robert Rubin and, and Timothy Geithner, the uh, secretary, uh, tr Treasury Secretaries of, uh, of Clinton and Obama, they're in the bloody grove as we speak. Um, they crashed the economy in 2008 to start a coldly calculated 
mega massive transfer of wealth from people to the rich 1%. First stage was the governments bailed out the banks. So now a banking problem is passed to a government problem. The government then passed it on to the people in austerity programs, making the banking problem through a government problem become a people problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was stage, stage one. Stage two was in Cyprus. Stage two in Cyprus was to set the precedent of removing the government in this transfer of wealth mm -hmm. and going straight from people from their bank accounts into, into the, the mega rich. Um, and this is why I keep saying to people, you know, wh while these austerity programs are, are going on and on and on, people leaving their homes because they can't get a benefit to stay there because they've got one bedroom too many, according to these people who are mega rich that are running this, the government of this country. While this is going on, there are still some people who are kind of okay. Mm -hmm. They're not part of this whole network of um, uh, that are transferring wealth from people to them but they're, they're pretty well off they might run biggish companies they might have a good job and all that stuff well what I'm trying to get across to them is if you I don't care how much money you've got I don't care if you're some celebrity if you're not part of this network they want your money too because that is designed to become that. And there ain't many in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So lots and lots of people, vast numbers of people, who might not be watching this because they think there's not a problem, well, they really ought to rethink. Because they, they're, they're symbolic and possibly literally, their door is going to be knocked on eventually. Because what they're doing is they're picking off different bits of society and they are hoping that others they're not touching at the start, at the time will look the other way and say it's not my problem mm -hmm. yeah. and that's why we have to come together because it's all our problem it's the problem now in Britain of people who uh, are leaving their homes because they've got one bedroom too many it's, it's a problem for people in America who are living in tent cities and it's the problem of people who are not in that state yet yeah when some way along the line, that's going to happen to them. Yeah. And this is why we have to come together. And why I say, you know, when I say about this symbolic situation at the Grove this weekend, you've got the tiny few, the elite, the elite few, the 1% and less than 1% in truth. You have the people, you have the ring of steel, and then what they want in this Hunger Games society is for that mega rich few and the mega poor masses for that status quo to be held in place by the ring of dark suits and uniforms that are keeping the people in line and keeping that status quo going. So here we have at the Grove, we have a situation where between the mega rich in the hotel and the people in the grounds, you have this cordon of police and security. Um, and that is the, the structure that they want global society to be. Uh, uh, but, but I would say that to, the, to these people in that, um, in that ring, in uniform. And it's, it's a strange psychological thing when you observe how although the people in those uniforms have come from the people in the grounds, not from the elite in the hotel, so many think their job is to protect authority in the hotel. It's, I'm here to protect authority. Notice, notice, police and the military do not take an oath of office to the people, but to the queen, mm -hmm. to the monarch. They are taking an oath of office to the people represented in that hotel. <coughs> and what I'm saying to these people in uniform and there are people who are starting to see it, but there's a difference between starting to see it and doing it. Mm -hmm. Is start to see that the people you're policing are the very same people who are trying to awaken people and alert people 
to a world that's coming towards us that will enslave your children and your grandchildren, which you've got to look in the eye one day and say, what were you doing, Daddy and Mummy? Well, I, I, actually, I was protecting them from, from the, those people who are doing all this. Mm. And what we need is a movement, a shift in perception and action within the police and within the military that turns its attention from thinking its, its whole reason for being is protecting the elite few and start to realize it's about protecting the many of which they are a part. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is instead of standing outside uh, uh, the Grove Hotel saying, well, you know, I kind of agree with you, mate, you know, I, I, I know, then refuse to police Bilderberg. Refuse. En masse, if you don't believe in what they're doing, then stop policing Bilderberg. Walk away, or in future Bilderbergs, just re say, I'm not doing it. Yeah. That's what we have to do. We need to, you know, <laughs> sounds strange, but I know people look, look for income and they look for all that. I mean, there's people driving, there's people driving these people in, in and out of the hotel. Yeah. Well, those drivers are not of the elite, they're of the people. Mm. So don't do it, refuse. You know, we've got to start turning discontent with the way things are, with action to change the way things are. And I hope this weekend will be a trigger for that. There's only, there's only one outcome if we continue the way we're going. Yeah. There's not going to be some, you know, it's not going to continue. If it's ramping up, it's ramping to somewhere. So, yeah, you know, time is of the essence. Yeah. Well, Robert, it was the first time you and Alex Jones met in person yesterday. Yeah. How was that? Very good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, Alex Jones gets a lot of stick uh, from people. <laughs> I've had a bit of stick myself over the years. I can't recall it vaguely. <laughs> um, uh, but and I, I, I've heard this stuff. Oh, Alex Jones, he's CIA, he's a friend, and all that stuff. Well, um, all I can say, uh, having watched Alex over the years and uh, met him last night, well, he's a bloody good actor then. Mm. Because people might not, might, might not like the way he goes about things, because uh, 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 it's, it's, you know, he's his own personality and people, it, you, you know, if, if you're not going to be criticised, well, I was going to say, if you don't want to be criticised, then just sit and stare at the wall all your life. But then someone will criticise you for doing that. Yeah. So, so, you know, <coughs> you're always going to get stick when you, when, you, when you put your head above the parapet. But... What I've seen of Alex Jones, you cannot, um, you cannot act the passion he has for what he does. You mm -hmm. can't. And um, it, you know, he, he he has made a major contribution to this whole thing, as uh, many people definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, yeah, I like the guy. Now you're setting up your own TV station. It's you've, you've got the the basic funding. Yeah, well, that's where we are. Um, I'll tell you what happened. Um, I had a guy from the Sunday Times uh, come to interview me about, um, that must be about five, five, six weeks ago now. And uh, it was horrible, basically. Um, and it was another concrete minded journalist. And, uh, you know, it, they said we wanted to do a, a major interview over many pages in the Sunday Times magazine uh, with an author of, of books that, that, in the way it's put together, it's kind of unique information. And the guy turns up to interview me and hasn't read a single page of any book. I mean, so, so when you're dealing with that, because what's happened is he's walked through the door with a preconceived idea. Yeah. The story's written for he's arrived. I, I, I'm just there to say he's talked to me, really. Um, and it really struck me. I thought, you know, we, we're not going to do this through the mainstream media. It's going to take too long, even then. Um, and, and, you know, are, are corporations that own the media going to expose themselves through the media they own? You know, yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I mean, let's just think about this. So I, I'm, w w what I'm saying in, in, in telling this story is that my mind was fertile and open to how can we bypass this? And it's a funny thing. A friend of mine, uh, Mike Lambert, a great mate of mine, great healer too on the Isle of Wight, he ca called me uh, just after the interview and he said, um, you know, on the Isle of Wight we have this um, a version of eBay called White Bay. Right. Where people on the Isle of Wight sell things. And um, he said, it's a radio station for sale. <laughs> oh, what? On oh, White Bay, you know? And so he checked it out. And, and there's, a, there's a guy who was running an internet radio station, very small, but he had the equipment and he had the gear and he was selling it for not very much. And it, it didn't suit us. It didn't suit me, uh, the requirements. But the Sunday Times article and internet radio station for sale triggered something mm -hmm. 
And I thought, well, okay, what, what can, can we do this? And I got together with Sean, a webmaster and producer, and he's uh, got vast experience in television, um, uh, working in television and stuff. Um, very good on the technical side and everything. And we thought, we'll go for it. Then we, how do we fund it? Uh, and then I, I'd never heard of these things, these, mm. you know, where you, uh, like Kickstarter, Kickstarter and, and all that stuff. And um, so we give it a go. And what we initially asked for, and, and by the way, none of this money's going to me. I'm, uh, it, it's totally non-profit making in the sense that all profits that we eventually make, we're going to make them for a while, um, will all be ploughed back to make it bigger, not, not into... I mean, I'm, I'm working for it for nothing. I'll go on working for it for nothing. But... Um, we asked for 100,000 because that was the minimum to get on air. That, that was to, to do a basic job where information would be communicated. But the fact that the 100,000 has been raised in six days, and there's another, uh, what, 23 left, 24 left, and 23 left today, um, means that if it goes on at this rate, then we're going to be going to air with something more than we thought we'd be able to. I, I knew what I wanted eventually, but I, we would have to grow to that we can get much closer to that earlier if this goes on. Um, and what I want is, um, I want uh, the English day covered by presenters of not just this information, but absolutely this information, and reacting to events and what have you, and giving people a platform <coughs> you know, for their expertise in areas the mainstream media wouldn't even go near them. Mm -hmm. But also exploring the nature of reality, uh, giving uh, bands and musicians the opportunity to uh, have, a, have a, a showcase that they would normally have, uh, comedians and all the rest of it. You know, I'm trying. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping Frankie Boyle will do something. Right. You know, I, I, can you imagine <coughs> the week with Frankie Boyle, <laughs> with, where Frankie Boyle has no censorship? Um, and that's what that, that the, that's the reason I'm I'm doing it. Um, the only censor of <coughs> output will be um, libel, because right. yeah. the last thing we want is to say anything about anyone that's not true anyway. But um, yeah, and um, <clears throat> what I want is the is the is the English day covered from 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 London. It will all be switched through London, but it's not all presented from London. I want the uh, North American day present uh, uh, and, and evening presented from America. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want other programs uh, giving us a, a look at Africa, of the Middle East, uh, and uh, Australia, New Zealand, that part of the world. <coughs> um, but in a way that is uncensored uh, and that people can speak the truth and not, you know, no one's going to be looking over their shoulders saying, <coughs> you can't say this, you can't interview this person, you mustn't allow him yeah. to say that. All gone, all gone, totally uncensored. And the power of that is going to be immense mm. because what you're doing is creating an example that the mainstream media isn't even close to and it's going to put pressure on them mm -hmm. to start acting like real journalists yeah. instead of repeaters of the official version of everything so you know it's it's looking good and I've, I've never been involved in anything in my life that that triggers a fantastic um, uh, response and support than this people's voice and that's what it is the, the, the people's voice you know there's going to be no David Icke show Mm. You know, I'm not going to be there. Oh, you know, I'm David. I don't want a people's <laughs> voice. Listen, oh no. I mean, I'll be in. I'll be. I'll be doing stuff on it. Yes, and flitting all over the place in in and out of the content as, yeah. as as. But no, no David Icke show. This is about giving the people the opportunity to hear what they need to hear and to say what they need to say. And about bloody time. There's a lot of people doing this now yeah. um, in, in in shows like yours and stuff like that. What I wanted to do was get something that's running 24/7. Um, so there's always there's always an outlet to see another another version of whatever's happening in the world at the time. And, and you know the great thing, I mean, you, you've got a camera there. This camera, by the way, <laughs> looks like a cinema screen. I've never seen anything that big. If you saw it from where I'm sitting, it's incredible. I'm waiting for it to become self-aware. Yeah, I'm it will be more self-aware. Given than that, he's worked really hard and every penny he's put into but building. What, I, what I'm saying is that the technological situation has now reached the point in which it's also, although the technological. Uh, developments are being being used to oppress and to keep surveillance on people and all the rest of it. It's also presenting a situation like all over the grove with the people. Yeah. You've got a camera. I mean, you're doing it now. Mm -hmm. yeah. You've got a camera, and 
you press a button and you're going on the web live yeah. um, in an instant. Now, that makes the kind of thing that I want to do with the people's voice absolutely possible, where um, you, you're not stuck with needing, you know, outside broadcast vans and yeah. all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So put all that together and, you know, I think three months, we're trying to get on the air, we <coughs> want to get on the air in November. It's a big ask because there's so much to do. Mm. But um, three months in, I think we'll be really impacted. And will it be going over satellite or internet? It will be going over the. It'll be going over the internet initially, uh, and that has benefits. Mm -hmm. It has benefits, and you're not stuck with all the regulation yeah, exactly. of the of the other the other channels. Yeah. That means that we can be uncensored. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you go through, you know, the the the. You know, other channels that you're, you're talking about suddenly you're into state regulations yeah. of this yeah. state you can't say that you can't say that I'm not interested in that mm -hmm. you know if, if, you, if you want to watch a media where someone in the background whether it be government or an editor is saying can't say that you can't interview him don't touch him and all the rest of it well that's uh, BBC <laughs> yeah the BBC ITV NBC mm -hmm. CBS all of them that's not what that's not no point yeah in doing a mirror of that. And the other thing I, I, I really want from the presenters is, you know, there's no shirt and ties and, 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 and here is the news. I want people with personality, yeah. right, uh, who are actually going to be themselves, who are going to be relaxed, who are, who are not going to be talking at people, but talking with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but, but people who are highly informed and um, are going to ask the questions that, the, you know, the mainstream media won't ask. And, you know, I, we, I've already got... Um, I had someone on, the, you know, in my, on, on my list of presenters, um, and um, she was sitting there, and uh, a lady called Sonia Poulton, who writes for the Sunday Express, she's uh, quite a regular on This Morning in ITV, and she's on the Jeremy Vine show on the BBC and stuff, uh, out, a, a really excellent um, mainstream journalist, but not a mainstream person. Um, who's been, you know, really desperate to, to say what needs saying within the constraints. And, yeah. and I thought, you know, come on, Sonia, go for it. She went for it immediately. So she's yeah. going to be a major frontline presenter from day one. And um, that's the kind of personality you want. But, yeah. you know, if people have got talent out there, they're confident and they're highly informed in the subjects, well, you know, this, there's the opportunity. It's yeah. there. Yeah. That's amazing. It's really Brilliant. Exciting Brilliant. news. So before we finish up, because I know you've got a really busy day, um, what, you're speaking at five? Five o'clock, yeah. Today, and uh, what are you going to be chatting? Bilderberg, obviously. Well, I'm gonna, uh, what I'm going to be doing, uh, I'm formulating it in my mind a bit, you know, because, you, know, you know, I don't read a script or anything. Mm -hmm. um, and I like, to, I like to go where the music takes me when I'm talking. It's yeah. lovely. Uh, but um, I want to put Bilderberg into context. Um, okay. There's a group of rich people and powerful people on the level that they operate in true power. They're village idiots and village weaklings, uh, but um, seven stone weaklings. But in the in the, the point that they operate, they have a certain amount of power, um, and they're, they're meeting in this hotel. So the question then is, what's going on? Why? What is Bilderberg? Why are they there? Why do they do it? Um, because Bilderberg, when put into context is uh, only part of a massive story. And I'm not going to go into the whole story, but I'm going to look at how Bilderberg fits in and what is really going on under that, <coughs> under that big roof mm. as we sit yeah. here today. Great. Brilliant. Well, thanks Thank for you. See you later. Thanks, David. Thanks for your time with so us. do I. <laughs> and uh, we'll see you later on this afternoon. Yeah, yeah we're going to be uh, live streaming on a barge in a little while with um, the with Mark Anderson, who took over from Jim um, Jim Ducker with American Free Press. So uh, we'll be live streaming then in about an hour as time. So uh, from a barge at Bilderberg. We'll see you later. Thank you. Bye.